Anyway, thanks for taking the time to speak to me. Mm -hmm. um, you finished the English, kind of the British leg of the tour now. And you're... Yeah, well, pretty much the European leg, really. I mean, the, the, what we've got next week is uh, we've got the 17 shows that are replacing the shows that I lost when I got when I was contracted via Alan and Giants last year. Mm. You know, it was uh, <coughs> so, which is a case of you know, you know, we were clipping those shows back in, which was really awkward. It was, it was just you know, last year was kind of you know, we just kept on tripping up and, and falling over stuff all the time. It was like. You know, we're Robin going down with, with chicken pox and then losing the UK tour, which was replacing December. Uh -huh. And then me catching the viral laryngitis after 29 shows in Europe, which was like out of the blue. So it's, uh, you know, it's been kind of juddering and, and, and shuddering along, you know, but we're nearly there, nearly there. You know? Nearly over the line. Mm. Now, when I reviewed uh, the, the gig, the Home, the Home Firth gig, yeah. Um, Thank you for that, by the way. No problem. Uh, it's, the weird thing is, I mean, I've seen you live on numerous occasions, but it's the first time I've actually gone, you know, as a reviewer and and kind yeah. of looked at it through, you know, sort of taking a step back and looked at it from the outside in, if you like. Um, yeah. And, you know, a fan phenomenal gig, fantastic gig. I mean, the feedback I got from everyone I spoke to were, you know, unbelievable. People are blown away. Now, it's kind of... Kind of falls in with what the the album as what people have been saying about the album. In in the review, I said that it's you know your best album in my opinion since Suits, which is one of my personal favourites. But the the yeah, it's a strange album. I was I was a favourite. It's not it's not mine out of the catalogue, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it was a strange album, Suits. You know, it, it's kind of um, for me. I think it just kind of you, you know when albums just click with you, and it just it just mm. kind of clicked with me. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I know there's, there's artists. You know, that, I mean, there's albums that I like, you know, that, that, of artists of other artists that are not necessarily the, the best albums that they ever ever did. But it was just an album that I just related to, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So, because uh, I mean, Suits was kind of one of those albums where, you know, I was kind of coming out of internal Excel, going independent, and you know, new producer, and there was kind of I've, the band was changing as well at the same time. And I think that was when we started getting into grooves and started to, uh, we started to play a lot, a lot about with grooves on, on the Suits album. And, you know, a lot of the endings probably went on too long, you know. I mean, a lot of the songs just went on just about a minute, a minute and a half too long. So, you know, just especially on the outros and stuff like that. So it was a kind of strange, but there's a lot of really good songs on it, you know. So like, um, but it's, it's the same with a lot of the material. I mean, I think, you know, Suits and, and I think the albums after that suffered. I mean, I think probably apart from Sunsets and Empire, but I think they suffered from uh, lack of investment in the production, mainly because I just didn't have the money to invest in the production, which, you know, it's easy to look back on now and kind of go, you know, well, if only we'd done this. But, I mean, you know, at the time, you know, when I went into, you know, I couldn't afford to, to spend 30 grand on a, on, a, on a producer, you know what I mean? So it was a, it was a very different vibe at the, around about that time. So, so, but so piece the of, piece of consequences was one that, you know, you know, I think I learned from 13 Star, I mean, bringing in Callum Malcolm just made such a huge, huge difference, you know? Well, uh, do you view 13 Star and, and Consequences as kind of, I don't know, sister albums? Even though the the, the, the kind of six, six years apart, they are not thematically the same, but they are they, they do feel very similar. They're, um... it's, I think that's because of Callum, you know, because, because I brought in Callum in at 13 Star and he brought in a real... He brought in a, a, a different mentality to the project, you know, and I think having having somebody that was outside the circle, right, and somebody yeah. that had a, a very good overview and had the experience that he's got with both songwriting and production, you know, he, he was able to point us, at, at, you know, at some of the faults and say, you know, well, we need to get rid of this or do this or why don't you change this around? And I think, especially as a singer, he gave me. A lot of confidence on on both albums. I mean, working one on one with Callum, I think, well, it was an incredible experience, you know. Mm. And I learned so much, you know, and 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 those over across those two albums and during the recording about singing technique, vocal technique, whatever, you know. Well, well, the biggest kind of criticism that I've had of the review that I wrote of the Home Firth gig is, is that I did describe it as the best album since Suits, and people have signed correcting me and, and said it's the best album you've done, uh, Feast of Consequences, which is. Phenomenal to say that you're 25 or 20 years plus into your solo career. It's uh... yeah, I mean, I think I think because 30 Star is such a high benchmark. Yes, 
that, and you know, it was daunting, right? You know, it was like, well, wait a minute, I've got to make an album that's better than 13 Star, and at the same time, you know, with, with the kind of traumas and, and, you know, with all the trauma that was going on in my personal life through the vocal operations, through the disaster of second marriage, blah, 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 mm. you know, I wasn't in the frame of mind to, to really get into writing, which is, again, you know, one of the reasons why there was, there was such a huge gap between it, but I was very aware that I was going to have to make an album as good as 13 Star, because I loved the 13 Star album, and, um, and I think, you know, coming into it, coming into the feast, you know, it was always going to be, yeah, it's going to be a big ask. And I was really proud that, you know, we, we took the time, you know, we didn't, I mean, this is a problem I think nowadays, it's, it's so easy just to like rattle off a piece of plastic and sell it. And then, then you know, once that's done, it's like the next piece of plastic, please. And, and I don't kind of work in that, 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 that style. You know, I kind of, you know, I go into writing an album and if it takes, if it takes a while to write it, then it takes a while to write it, you know, but it's got to be right, you know. And I think Feast of Consequences had, you know, there, there was a lot of pressure on us, you know, with, with Feast of Consequences as well, you know, I mean, you know, because, I mean, Frank and Forrest, I mean, the, you know, the original, the original idea was to take it in a, from an acoustic kind of bass, you know, through, yeah. and then Frank and Forrest just weren't around. It was like, you know, I kept on calling for writing sessions and stuff, and why we get together, and we could never get anybody to, in, in, in the studio. And then the time was going on, it was, we were getting into the middle of, what was it, 2012 by that point. Mm -hmm. And that was when, you know, I decided to bring Steve Vances back into the, the equation. And I think, you know, that kind of, um, that rattled a lot of cages, you know. Yeah, yeah. And think, of course, when Steve came in, Steve came in like full bore. And then the next thing, you know, Frank was out, out of the equation. And then, you know, and, and Foz and I were kind of concentrating on Highwood and Steve and I were working on a lot of the other stuff. So it was... Um, it kind of split into two different kind of writing sessions, and and they didn't really all start to come together till the end of 2012, when you know people got involved in, in, in the other side of the project. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned there the you know, like like the difficulties you had with your throat, and they're well documented. I don't really want to go over them uh, again and again, but it was a cyst. Yeah, you know? yeah. And... I mean, it was a cyst that had been there for the reckon for over two years. So when I'd been singing on that entire 30 star tour, and probably before then. You know, I was dealing with, with a, a voice with, with, with a, 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 a serious infection on the cord and a big lump on it. And I, I had no idea I had it. And you know, it was, it was kind of, you know, after I had the operation, it just changed things completely, which is my voice just came back, you know. I mean, you know, to some extent. I mean, you know, one of the problems I've got is that you know, people will go, oh, well, his voice, blah, blah, blah. He doesn't sing like he did in the old days. It's like, no, I won't sing like I did in the old days because I was singing wrong. I mean, you know, from a technical yeah, perspective, yeah, yeah. I was singing very badly. Because, um, you know, that falsetto that I was using on, on, on scripts and Fugazi and even into, you know, um, even on the misplaced, you know, mm. I was singing unnaturally high, you know, and I was, I was well out of the, the zone of where I should have been singing. I mean, okay, it became acknowledged as my style, but it was, you know, I paid the price for that later on in, in 1988. I was really starting to suffer, you know. And um, you know, it was it was just because I knew nothing about music when I was in Marillion. I mean, nothing. And I never. So you received no, you, you had know, no formal training or vocal training. No, no, not at all. So it's like you know, when Steve or Mark, you know, came up with something and played it, you know, I just sung it. You know, mm. it was very rarely it was kind of you know when I went, well, that's a bit too high. You know, I'd find I'd find a way around it. Mm. You know, so all the keys were always worked towards, you know, what Steve wanted to play. It was it was to work really towards his guitar, in the main. Right, which is the you know one of the, the things he, he said you know recently, most recently when you know, when you know he asks about you know you know working with, with me again and singing the old stuff he just said that he just won't change the keys you know mm. he said fish can't sing the old stuff like he used to which I acknowledge you know and he just turned around and goes well you know he, he would never change the keys that's the keys that were written and so it's fair enough you know but I think you know every singer I mean Phil, from Phil Collins to Bono right across the range you know the the, the further you get, you get down the road in your career the more you've got to kind of reevaluate the keys you're singing in, and the keys I'm singing in now, I'm very happy with. And I think, you know, as long as I can get the soul and the emotion and the passion, you know, from, from the song, then it doesn't matter what key it's in. It's, I mean, you know? it's not an age thing, though, because, I mean, um, if you look at Dio in the 80s, I mean, he was at the peak of his prowess as a vocalist, whether you like yeah. him or not. But when he went on tour, he used to detune because he was doing it every yeah. night, so, you know, to, yeah, yeah. to look after his voice, and it was, you know... The... Yeah, and again, you know, when I was a kid, when, you know, when, I was, when, I was, when I was young, you know, when you're in the studio, you know, especially when you're in the studio, you know, you get 25 takes trying yeah. to hit that note, you know? 
you don't get that alive. You only get one, yeah. you know. And if it goes wrong, you take somebody's eye out in the front row. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? It's like, you know. So I mean, you know, I just adjust. I mean, it's another reason why I've made the decision to retire as well. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I mean, I went in to see, you know, after the, you know, after the, when I got contracted by the laryngitis, mm-hmm. I was lucky enough, and, and when I was in Erfurt in Germany, there was a voice specialist in the hospital on the night that I all went down. And, you know, he did an examination and he just said, you know, you've got scar tissue on that cord. And he said, you've lost the elasticity in the cord. And he said, you, you've got to be careful with it because he said, you know, he said, if you were to cut, I mean, at the time he said to me, he said, if you were a teacher, I'd tell you to take at least three weeks off. Yeah. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, I've got, I've got past viral laryngitis on a part previous to in a week. And it was like, uh, and he said, forget it. And he was right, it was four weeks, you know. And there's a lot of people at it. I mean, my mum's had it for, and she was off for four weeks, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, Mark Wilkins, his wife, and it's one of them things, but, you know, what he said to me was, you know, there's a weakness on the cord. And he said, you know, you will, because of the way you're singing it and because you're singing two hours a night, which, you know, my production manager keeps on shouting at me, he cut the sets down, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, because I'm singing two hours a night and because we were doing, you know, touring on a bus, I wasn't getting the recovery. I wasn't getting, you know, the, the rest that really allowed me that deep seat of sleep where, you know, your body starts yeah, to repair absolutely. itself. and. And with that, it's like, you know, as the doc said to me, he said, your problem is you're a singer. And he said, your Achilles heel, so to speak, is, is that cord. And he said, every time you're going you're gonna to get run down and all the rest of it, he said, you know, any, any time, you know, your immune system falters, he said, that is what's going to happen to you. And the, the guy in Erfurt said to me, he said, you've got to stop doing four in a row, try and cut it down to, you know, get yeah. it down to threes, and threes maximum and put twos in and stuff like that. And you start putting, you know, two in a row a day off, three in a row a day off, you know. You get more days off, every day off, you're still paying for a bus, you're still paying for, you're still paying wages to a band that's yeah. out on the road, you know. So you're in, a, you're in a situation where, you know, it becomes, it's not cost effective to tour. You know, and if I was, if I was playing 2,000, 3,000 a night, yeah. you know, it would be a lot easier to handle. But at the level I'm playing at, you know, it's, it's, it's I have to... I have to adjust to the to the budgets, and the budgets say that you know we can't have hotels every night. We can't do you know tra- tra- travel and what you might call the comfort that we could we could really do. With. So I've just got to face up to the facts that like it ain't going to get any bigger. So like I've got to put a, a, a tag on it, and that's why I've announced you know the the, the 2017 final shows. You know, and they they'll start next year. I mean you know we're like you know with a. Well, this year, it's, a, it's Farewell to Sheldon. It's going to be the last time I play the Misplaced Sheldon album. And, you know, it's going to be interesting going through that and, and adjusting to, you know, adjusting the keys and getting them sorted out. But, you know, we'll make a, you know, we will make a fantastic version of it, you know. But it's um, it's just one of those things where, you know, you know, like I said, you know, we're having a, a chord and you've just got to face up to the facts that, you know, you've, you've got to change the way, the way you sing. You've got to change the way you approach, you know, the way you put shows, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, you know, as I said, I'm quite happy with that. And you know, I, my my hand goes up, I acknowledge it, and you know, I'm dealing with it. Hmm? I mean, from my point of view, um, I, I, I obviously the some of the songs are in, in a lower key, but I thought your voice was completely on point. I thought it was spot on. On thank you. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was as well because I was. I mean, I, I was very nervous for the UK tour because you know, after everything. I'd been told about the threes, the promoter had put in a four, three, two, four. And I'd said to Yata at the time when he gave me, my production manager, when he gave me the dates, I said, look, fuck, man, you're, you know, you're asking me to run a marathon of 58 shows or whatever it was. And I said, then you want me to do a sprint finish, right? And I said, you know, I'm 56 year old now. I said, you know, this is getting too much. And like, I was very nervous before the UK shows and I was really watching what I was doing. You know, and 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 I pulled it off, and I was I was I was very proud that I did manage to pull it off. You know, but I mean, for example, as two we're going out with the 17 dates. I mean, you, we do have a lot of days off, not just because they're chosen, but I mean, or allocated, but I mean, because of the drives. Because I mean, another problem we've got at the moment is that every venue wants gigs on the Friday and Saturday. Yeah. They don't want they don't want Monday Tuesdays, and it's like you know when you're on the road, you know you can't turn around and say, well, the band's going to be put in a hotel for three days and we're only going to play mm-hmm. weekends. You can't do that, you know. Um, but like I said, I mean, it's, it's just a reality checks right across the board. I mean, you know, and I think as well, I think we working with Steve. I mean, I think we'll, you know, on Thirteen Star when we put it together, and especially on Feast of Consequences, when we put the material together, it was done for the voice. It was 
the, all the keys in the recording were worked to the voice, that the voice was shining, you know? Yeah, yeah. So they were sitting there, it was able to, to, it was able to sit within the music, you know, and, when I, and I had space to move. And I think a lot of that I learned from the, from the Fishheads Club tour, from the acoustic tour, yeah. because when I came back from the operations, you know, it was a case of refinding my voice, refinding my confidence as well, because it had been very much shot on the 13 Star Tour. I mean, you know, every night I was walking out and I didn't know where the voice was because I didn't know there was a cyst on my cord. Yeah. And the, the ibuprofen and the antibiotics that I was taking on a, a regular basis, right, were basically fighting off the infections. But, you know, it, it would just keep on bubbling up again as soon as, you know, as soon as the, the kind of chemicals stopped working, then, you know, the voice started to shred. And I think, you know, on the acoustic tour, it was going out and rebuilding it and, and retraining it. So when I came in, and I, it was the dynamics, I think, of having, working within the acoustic format, where you've, you've just got a guitar and a keyboard, right? There's so much space to play about with. So I was playing with the dynamics and playing with, um, playing, this, playing inside the space. And that's, you know, what I wanted to utilize, and that was exactly what I, what I did on the Feast of Consequences album, especially in Highwood, you know, when I was working with Fuzz. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, um, you know, we, we, we geared everything around the voice. So the, the, the voice was, was strong and it was, you know, and it was able, I had the space to play with it, you know, and, and, and that shows on the stage. That's what, what happened at home first, you know. I think, I think when, you're not being, when you're not singing to a backing that's incredibly busy, um, especially when you strip things back acoustically, you can, things sound great in a lower register. You know, things sound... Yeah. You know, the I think fine. my voice is better than it was. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Years ago. I mean, I think it's got a lot more power in it now. But you know, it's because I'm I'm singing lower and I, and I feel more comfortable singing and 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 I want more comfortable. I'm more confident singing in those keys. You know, I think I think um, if you look at people like Ian Anderson, um, whose voice changed dramatically when you know, kind of in his thirties, and he, he never kind of got it back. Um, because he sang through apparently sang through a viral throat infection and went on an intensive tour. Um, and then compare that to, to you sound as good now, if not better than you did sort of like 10, 15 years ago, because... I, I mean, I like my voice better, better now than, than, than I did. I mean, I listen back to the old Morelli material, I mean, something we're putting set lists together, I'm just listening to some of the songs, and I get just... It's like a different person, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like a completely different voice. And it's interesting you mention Ian, you know, because, I mean, Ian's, what, in his mid-60s now or something? He and uh, I mean, I've, I've, I do a lot of, he's a, an old friend of mine, you know. And even when he goes there now, he's got a, a, a kind of backing vocalist that, that sits with him on the, that sits with him on, the, on all the, 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 the tall stuff. Yeah. So he's got a mask on, he's got a mask on his own voice as well, which is great. It means he doesn't have to push it as much. And, you know, because he's got a young voice sitting there behind. But, you know, I, I don't really want to get, I mean, I've used backing vocalists, and we probably will use a backing vocalist in the misplaced shell thing, but. You know, as because it's a great effect, and I love working with yeah. it. I'm, I'm, I'm the female backing vocalist. You know, it really adds something to what to what I do. You know, but at the same time, you know, it just means that you know, rather than taking that the high point on a chorus, you can you can just drop off back, but you still get the effect. Yeah. You know, so. But you know, I don't. I just don't want to be doing it when I'm sixty. I just don't want to be. You know, it is it, touring's become a lot more stressful than than it ever was. You know. Yeah. Well, the demands are a lot more than they ever were, you know. I mean, I do want to sort of briefly ask you about kind of post-retirement, but um, just before then, I just want to ask you about your lyrics. Um, there's a line in uh, the song, Feast of Consequences, that's, uh, it's, uh, did I want you to change your mind? I don't honestly think so. Um, mm-hmm. Which kind of resonated with me. It's, it's kind of a big, that's the big line in that track for me. It's kind of mm-hmm. It's kind of like the looking back and seeing things honestly rather than how you see them at the time because we kind of we we kind of create um k- kind of a, I don't know a cocoon of of kind of self delusion sometimes don't we that's yeah well that was what it was about i mean i think probably that song was was um it was probably the, the the one song on the album that was most influenced by my temperament my 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 temporary marital situation yeah. you know and it was kind of, you know, I think, you know, you're writing something up, it was, you know, you try and fool yourself into thinking that everything's okay and it's not, you know, and then when you take the step back, you go, fucking hell. Yeah. How did I, how did I get into that <laughs> yeah, shit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know. But, but when you're being that open and raw 
in your lyrics. I think it helps people to trust you. I think it helps your audience to trust you because the. Oh, that's the way I write. It's always been my style. I mean, absolutely. There's, there's an always, inherent Marilyn honesty. Marilyn always used to raise eyebrows a bit, you know. You used to always every time you, you know you you're writing a lyric and they go, wait a minute, it's like you know it's not like a little bit open. And it's, I mean, it's like even on Kaylee, it was like they didn't want me to call it Kaylee. Because he said, oh, you can't do that because he's your ex-girlfriend. Yeah. So, well, that's the way it is. You know, that's, that's the way it's going to be. But, but is know? there ever a time where you look at something and you think, I, I can't touch that, it's too raw, it's too confessional, or is it just a, a matter of time, You'll, you can go back, it's too confessional at the time, and it's too raw at the time, you can go back and revisit it, or, or, or are there things that you well, just... Well, 30, 30 Star was, 30 Star was fucking hard. Yeah. You know, I mean, that was a very, very difficult... Um, they were difficult, difficult lyrics to sing at the time, because it took me a, a bit to... It took a while to, to extricate myself from that particular car wreck, you know? But, but that, that, and, that's um, my point, because you know, certainly you, you now when you play things, is, isn't there a... Is there, is there not almost a point where you don't want to sing what you were singing because you, it's out of your system, and it, or does it mean something well, different I'll, to I'll, you? I'll give you, an, I'll give you a, the classic example of that is Ark of the Curve. Right? Yeah, yeah. And it's strange, because, I mean, you know, my girlfriend and I have been together for, for more than four years now, you know? And it was strange, you know, I found it a bit strange singing that particular song. And you know when my girlfriend was 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 at one of the other gigs, you know what yeah. I mean. And um, it's a base, base a song, you know. And that's the way I've got to look at it. At the time, at the time, I was a lot more emotionally entangled in it all, you know. But now, you know, with the distance, I mean, I always say <clears throat> that, you know, I, I didn't even know made the, the gag at home for this. Like, you know, if, <clears throat> if I hadn't been a I hadn't been a writer, I would have been spending hundreds of thousands of pounds in therapy and counselling, you know. <laughs> And it was, um, and I think that's it. I think you know, with, with lyrics and stuff, you know, you, you kind of compartmentalise some of your problems, and you, you you wrap them up in tidy little boxes. And you know, as, as my the one time I went to council, I was like, you know, she said your problem is that you you've intellectualised about everything, and you've come to terms with everything on an intellectual basis, but you've just not dealt with them emotionally. And I think that's one of the, the things I've got, and, and with some of the songs, you know, a lot of the songs are written. As self-expression, as you know, trying to find some understanding within whatever particular darkness or whatever it is, you know. And then you wrap them up in little boxes, but you've not really dealt with them, you know. But it's, uh, but you know, you've kind of, you, you, you've kind of pushed, you put them in the, in the in the cupboard at the back of the house. But every now and again, you open the door and all four of the boxes fall out and open up. So when you, know? so when you look back on things, do you, do you ever think, ah, oh, that was that's what I meant by that? You know, that's what I was talking about there. Because, oh yeah, I mean, there's different levels. I mean, I always look on there's been there's different levels within a lyric. You know, there's the there's the conscious there's the, there's a conscious level which is kind of what you're trying what you've, you're 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 trying to write about. You know, mm. and then and then there's a subconscious level. There's there's kind of there, there's another level. It's, it's like what you're trying to hide within it. You know, yeah. and then there's another level about why you wrote it. Right, and I think you know. It was really strange that a song like Incubus, you know, which, you know, is written about, you know, um, uh, uh, the model and the photographer and, you know, two career people that, that kind of are in love and drift apart. And, yeah. you know, and then there's the jealousies that come into it and, and stuff. And that was very much, you know, the, 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 the first level is about the, the photographer and the model. This is the level it was written about, that I thought it was written about, was to be myself and Kay, who was my girlfriend at that time, yeah. who was, Kaylee was written about. And then there's another level, which is, you know, kind of, there's a, there's a kind of, there's a deep subconscious level, right? And if you want to look at it, you, you could be, you could look at that and say, that's Derek Dick writing about fish, you know? I mean, the fascinating thing is that no matter how many people hear your music, there's always going to be a level that only you understand. There's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Absolutely. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of songs in there that, there's, I mean, you know, there's, there's little things, I mean, like on Sunsets and Empire, there's, um, on the actual song and that, there's a lot of very personal stuff within Sunsets, and um, that I only I know what it's about, right? Yeah. But I mean, but that opens me up for for you know the the post music career stuff where, you know, if, you know, there's obviously going to be an autobiography, but it's not going to be your standard kind of rock musician's autobiography. It won't be that by any means, right? And you know, it's not something I think I'm even going to manage to encapsulate in one book. And then, you know, there's, there's, there's a lyric thing. I mean, I could take every one of the lyrics and just go, this is what this was about, this is what happened at the time, so it links into the autobiography, you know? So, uh, you yeah, know, there's a lot of things to be done. You know? It's not going to be kind of like a real-life Espada Street or anything like that, is it? It's going to be... No, I mean, you know, honestly, I've, there's one of the ideas I've got is for, 
it's for a screenplay that's um I wouldn't say it's it's Espadare Street, but it's it's something along similar lines, you know. And uh and it's something I'm, that's something I've been thinking about for oh three, four years. Espadare Street's such and a I've good had, book. I've had people I've had people like film people have said, you know, it'd be great to do this. I mean, I tried to buy Espadare Street of Ian like years and years ago, you know, because I mean Ian Banks was was an old friend of mine, you know. Mm-hmm. And it was I mean I actually met him. I was introduced by um uh, Neil Gaiman, who did an interview for me for Nave Magazine of all things, and right. he, it was him that said, "You know, have you ever met Ian Banks?" And it, that was how I got introduced to him. You know, and I, and I actually spoke to Ian about about that, and he said, "You know, was I the influence?" Because I mean, Neil had said, he said, "For Can I this He said, "It's you." He said, "It's, it's from right across the board." He said, "It's, it's like somebody written a, a, a book about you." You know, so it was um, so yeah. So I mean, that, again, it's, it's just part of the next the next level I'm going to. You know, so so I mean, looking at that, I mean, you've 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 dabbled if you if you want to call it that in acting in the past. Um, I mean, you've acted. I mean, call it dabbling, but you've actually acted again alongside Oscar winners like Adrian Brody and. Uh, yeah, I mean, minor, it's all minor stuff. I mean, I think if I got into acting in the mid '80s, right, then I think you know, I think my acting career would have been a lot stronger, right? I think it would have been a lot more prevalent. I think I would have probably, been, you know, I think I would have, it, it would have taken on a, a, a lot more um, space in my life. But the thing was, you know, I'm in a five-piece band, and what do the other four guys do if I'm acting? Yeah. You know, I mean. You know, I mean, that was one of the problems. Is the manager didn't really push me. You know, he didn't push me in the act. He did exactly the opposite. It was kind of like, well, you know, you don't need to, you can't do this. And I would, I would never be allowed the time off. So, and then I went solo. And ever since then, it's been, you know, the, the problems always been that I've never had the time because, you know, you're doing, you're doing writing albums, you're doing tours and trying to find projects to, to, to work with. And you're doing additions on... Movies that you never know when they're going to happen. I mean, you know, I had a movie that was I was supposed to be doing, it, you know, last summer, and you know, the whole thing fell apart after about after my friend had spent about nearly two, three years setting the whole thing up, and that's the problem. It's like it's a, it's you know, um, you know, to to mesh diaries or or to mesh those two careers is 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 practically impossible. But you know, but acting is you know, I mean, if I'd had the experience, I think I would have. I would have made more of a name for myself, but, uh, but I mean, you know, it's, it's, again, it's just a reality check, you know, I mean, you know, I'm 56 years old, yes, I can play character actors, but I'm never, you know, but I'm never going to be, you know, the action hero, and the problem is when you're my size, you know, everybody wants you to do physical roles, and it's, um, forget it, so, but I'd rather write, that's my passion, you know, yeah. you know, so, I mean, I, you know, if, if, if a forestry worker had a dream of becoming, you know, you know, a rock singer, then the rock singer's dream is to be, you know, a film director and writer. And and those are two distinct parts of you, aren't they? Two distinct uh, parts of your personality. The before the the music and the after the music and whatever comes next, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's the right time. I know I have complete and utter confidence that this is the right move, you know. I don't want to be singing when I'm, when I'm 60. I mean, yeah, yes, I don't want to be singing. I mean, I don't want to be in a position where, you know, I'm having to go out on a tour and having to write albums. You know, this is, you know, the format, it's, um, you know, it's very restrictive, writing lyrics, you know. And again, you know, with my voice and stuff, et cetera, et cetera, and just the way the business is, it's just changed so much, you know. The 80s was a glorious period, you know, and now I just, I just feel it's a very tired industry. It's a very... Um, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't seem to have a direction anymore, and everybody's scrabbling around, and you know, and it's like, you know, I'm, I'm too old for that now. Well, I, you know? I was going to ask you about that. I mean, where would an artist like you, where would how would Fish get on if he was starting out at sort of like 19, 20, 22, 23 year old now? No idea, no idea. I've got no idea, and I've got no interest in even contemplating that. Mm, fair enough. You know, it's um, you know, I I just you know, I, I um. I look on, you know, people starting off nowadays. I mean, I get asked that question with so many people. Yeah. And I go, I've got no idea. I have no idea. You know? Yeah, I, I so, suppose I mean, it's not relevant. But then again, then again, you know, what I'm faced with, you know, I'm going to have to learn about book publishing. I'm going to have to learn an awful lot more about script writing and, and things. And I look on that as a challenge, you know, that I relish, yeah. you know. Yeah. But I have to have the space and the time to do that. I cannot maintain a career in the music business and try and be a writer at the same time because it's like... 
you know, it's, it's they're, they're two completely different disciplines, and it's, it's it's time for me to get involved with writing. Like I said, I mean, it's it's time to break out of the music format, break out of the restrictions of writing lyrics, and 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 do something else. You know, I I, th- I think you you mentioned in the past that you've got probably you do one more album, and then uh, and mm. that'll be it. That's the idea of Elchmelts. Yeah. You know? And that's the album that we're going to start writing uh, basically this year. And the idea is to get it uh, written this year, finish off the writing at the, at the very beginning of next year and record it for a release in kind of April, May next year. You know? And then will you will you make a big fuss of, of the, the, the kind of the, it being the final album and maybe do... Yeah, so it's just, I mean, I'm, I'll... I mean, what I'd like to do is I'd like to get some, there's a lot of musicians I've met in, in my life, you know, who shall remain nameless. That's, you know, some of them I'd like to, to, to get involved either as, as a, in a guest spot or whatever on the album, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's, the album's going to be kind of autobiographical in a way. It's going to be a bridge album, you yeah. know? It's a bridge from one career to the next. That's the way I, I kind of look at it. That's the way Mark Wilkinson and I have been discussing the artwork and stuff at this point in time as well, you know? But yeah, I, I want to make a really great follow-up to, to Feast the Consequences, something that's going to stand alongside Feast the Consequences. You know, at the same time, you know, this year, you know, repackaging, remastering the back catalogue, a lot of which you can't even find nowadays, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So if I get that done, then I've got a definitive catalogue to leave behind, you know? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, that's always going to be there, isn't it? It's not like your, your music's yeah, going to exactly, disappear. Yeah. It's, um... And, if, you know, like I said, I mean, you know, it's, I'm not saying I'm never going to sing again, but... You know, if if I'm moving to Germany as I intend to do, right? I'm sitting out there, and if, if I get bored and I need to get my kicks, then it'd be easy to put together, a, you know, a small fish heads club too, and go out for ten shows. I just go and play for a couple of weekends a year, yeah. you know, and just have a laugh and do it. You know, you don't you don't have to make a big song and dance about it. You know, I can go out relatively low profile and and sell a couple of hundred tickets, three hundred tickets to, to, for a, for a couple of acoustic gigs and stuff, and like. You know, I get a laugh, you know, I got a chance to go on a stage to do a bit of singing, but that's not going to be, you know, that's, it's been done as, that becomes a hobby, you know. Yeah, you, you do it for the pleasure. Um, it's yeah, exactly, really you know. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think anybody who's a, who's, who's a fan of yours would want you to carry on, uh, if you're not feeling it, if you're not wanting to carry on, because that... That's all I always said, I mean, I always said that, you know, when I stopped having fun on, on the road, when... When it, when it suddenly started to become a job, so to speak, mm-hmm. right? Then that was when I had to give it up, right? And that's where I'm reaching, you know. And I kind of realised on on the last tour that it was it was moving into that, which is why I've paced it out, which is why I've I've done, you know, I've written the kind of manifesto for two six two fifteen sixteen seventeen, and I know what I'm doing, and I've got enough space to write, enough space to recover, enough space to entertain, you know, other ideas and get things started. And at the same time, you know, get the album done and put a tour together that's like, you know, that's it. You know, let's call it a day, you know? You've also... You... I mean, it was funny, I mean, even on the last tour, I was playing gigs, and I was going, I'll never play this gig again, you know? Yeah, yeah. And there, was a, there was a couple, two or three on, on, on the British tour. It was like, well, I won't be back here, you know? Do you remember, I, I don't know if you will remember, years ago, I think it was the Sunsets on Empire's uh, tour, you played Halifax Victoria Theatre, and it was so. Mm. I I live in, lived in Halifax at the time, and I didn't even know till the day before that you were playing there. It was so badly advertised. Um, there was hardly anybody there. There was hardly there, anybody there, and it was one of people ask me now what the best gig I've ever been to is, and it was that gig because you still did two hours, and the people were asking you to say, you know, carry on telling a story. If it's don't don't do any more because I need to go to the loo, and you were saying, okay, and mm. you fill the time, and it became kind of a kind of an intimate sort of kind of little club gig. Um, yeah. And it's kind of uh, things like that. Um, well, man, well, you know, one of my favourite tours ever, I mean, one of my favourite ever, ever times was, was on the Fish Heads Club tour, yeah. you know? It was, just, it was just great, just going out and having fun with no pressure and just going out and singing. And like I said, what you just said, I mean, you're having an intimate atmosphere where you can contact people and there's a great sense of communion, you know, in, in all the venues. I loved that. It was fantastic mm-hmm. fun, you know? It was one of the things, one of the reasons why Frank was, was kind of left the band, because he was wanting to go back to that. You know, he, he was kind of, he, he thought that Fish Consequences was going to be an acoustic album that we were going to play in a Fish Heads Club format, you know? Yeah. And it's like, no, Frank, we've got, this is an electric thing, and it, it just wasn't where he wanted to go, you know? 
Oh, oh, okay, so he wanted to to make an acoustic album rather than a, an electric. Frank album. thought it was going to be a Fish Heads Club tour, and he was. Yeah, I think Frank was just. I didn't. I don't think Frank was was that keen on going back up to full band scenario and stuff like that. Okay. But you know, I mean, I've seen Frank on Monday. I mean, you know, because we, we, like I said, the documentary we're working on is a Polish documentary from 2011 mm. that's been faffing about for years and years and years for loads of reasons. You know. So I sent out to him, so Frank and Foz and I meet up on the Monday, we talk about it, about how everything goes and stuff like that. So, you know, you know, these guys are all still my friends and we'll all work together. I mean, you know, I could be out in Germany in 2017-18 and it'll be, you know, well, I can phone up Frank and Foz and go, you want to come across and do some shows, you know? Mm-hmm. You know? I think I think that's good. I mean, it's 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 good that you, that that you've got that honesty between each other as well. You know, that if somebody doesn't want to do something, that they'd rather not do it than do it begrudgingly. You, know? you can force people to do it. I mean, Frank left the band on Frank left the band before Sunsets and Empire, yeah. Right? Yeah. because he didn't like the direction of the Sunsets and Empire album. He didn't like it, and he didn't like Thirteen Star either. You know, and it's um, and I think you know that was one of the you know when somebody says that you know I'm not going to force anybody to go out on a tour and play stuff you know nobody should be forced you know no. no session musician should be forced to play material they don't like and even within the current lineup you know if somebody you know doesn't like a particular song i mean you know robin was very adverse to um uh arc of the cover at the beginning but he got into it you know yeah. he played it and it was you know, once he found his feet in it and he was playing it brilliantly at the end of the last tour you know so do you play an instrument yourself when you write no nope. nothing no nope. Nothing. Do you do you sing melodies or guitar lines to a yeah yeah yeah, yeah. sing melodies? If I come together, I'll put rhythms down. You know, what I mean, for example, you know, like the gathering with Foz was kind of it was um, very vocally led. Mm. You know, and and Foz found the the groove that I was singing in, and then he pieced it together. You know, I mean, the lyric was written before he finished the music. You know? well, well, people ask me. Um... What, what, how to describe your music? I never use the word prog. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it I, is. It's just, it, it, can, yeah. it seems to cover everything from bebop deluxe to, I don't know, to dream theatre. You know, it's it's kind of a lot of music that's anathema to me, and it's not. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. I just play what I want to play. Yeah, you know. Well, I mean, I, do, I just, I, you know, I, I'd hate to be in a band like Bon Jovi or something where it's like, you know, this is what you play, and this is this is your style, and this is what you've got to keep moving yeah. in. I mean, I go nuts. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why. You know why, the, why I've managed to make so many albums and why I've got such diverse music because, you know, as long as it feels good, it works. Yeah, you know? and it's the reason people stay with you because people don't want to be fed the same thing repeatedly. I don't think. Yeah, um, yeah that's why I always get annoyed with people who say, "Well, why don't you do another script? Why don't you do another Mr. Shoulders?" So I did it. You know, yeah. why don't I want to do it again? You know. Well, it's it's yeah. <laughs> I mean, you have got a lot. And that's of pe- the problem. I don't work to formulas. I do not work to formulas. You know. And like I said, the whole Feast of Consequences thing was born from that Fishheads Club tour. That was, you know, if you look at all the songs, the, the, the dynamics within the songs, especially in Highwood, you know, yeah. you know, you can see the influence that that acoustic tour had on it. And a lot of those songs that's on the Feast of Consequences could be played on it acoustically. I mean, that's how we wrote them, yeah. you know? I mean, that, to be honest, I mean, it's um, Highwood's the, my favourite part of the album anyway. It's the, my favourite section. I think it's... It, Thank it's you. Just... It's just... Well, what's the one? I think it's... it's, it's um, you know, the five songs as a, as a complete piece of piece of music and lyric. Yeah. It's probably it's, it's one of the things I'm probably the most proud of. Yeah. You know. Well, so, he, someone was asking me about Led Zeppelin the other day. My favourite Led Zeppelin song is the Rain song. It's not one of their big rockers, but it's. I love that song it's too. Because it's yeah. because it sounds like a film soundtrack, and the, the yeah. way that I describe your music is cinematic. It sounds. It mm. feels. It's it's hard to describe without. Well, the quote the quote I always gave, and it was nicked by Steve Hackett, was like. You know, I write, I write, you know, music. I write movies for people's ears. Yeah. You know? So, so, so that's kind of like a conscious thing, is it? Is it kind of mm. to be that cinematic? Yeah, because I've always been a very descriptive lyricist, you know. And I think with that, you know, I don't want the words to be lost, you know. You know, I don't look on the words as being a kind of secondary thing that's added on to complete the song. You know, it's very, very lyrically driven. Yeah. Very, very. In fact. You know, that is my thing, lyrics. I mean, you know, I'm not... I'm a writer that sings, I'm not a singer that writes. Yeah. You know? But that's kind of that, that's kind of like... Um, that's not to put your actual singing ability down, is it? That's that's kind of like how you see your, your, what your priority is, is it? That... That's, I don't like my voice. Right. 
I don't like my voice because I don't I don't sound like how I want to sound. How would you want to sound if you? If you I don't I don't know. It's just I don't know. I don't I don't. You know, <clears throat> I, I just I don't like hearing my own voice. You know, I mean, one of the, one of the things that I hate the most on this planet is sitting listening to to, to live stuff and. You know, listening to you know, especially when you you put a live album together and you've got to continual listening to like concert after concert after concert, reading out the bits. I hate that. It's the most. That's the most. It's water torture to me. You know? is, is that is that, is that the, the like the, the singing or the talking in between the tracks or both? No, it's just, it's the singing. It's just the singing and the, and the music. I mean, you know, I mean, there's piano bands that you know they they finish a gig and then you know they're all sitting on the tour bus and they're listening to the gig on the tour bus. The last thing I want to yeah. hear after a gig is the gig. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, it's it's that's yeah. I suppose it's uh, that's understandable, but I, I suppose people will be surprised that you don't like the sound of your own voice because I think a lot. Of, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of singers feel that way. To be honest, yeah. <laughs> I I, I, I suppose, like yeah, that. from my point of view, I mean, I grew up and I was in bands when I was in my sort of late teens, early twenties, and and you were a big influence, you know, vocally. And it's kind of it's kind of hard, you know. It's it's it's, it's un- I, I would I would be. I would, put it this way: I would have given at 19 years old. I would have given my right leg to sound like you. So, you know, for, for you to say that you didn't, you yeah, know, but it's just, but it's just perspective, you know. Of course, it's just, it is. It's, yeah. yeah, it's perspective and things. It's just, you know, you know, I always want to say like Stevie Winwood or something like that. You know, I hear, I hear Otis Redding and go, "That's what I want to say." Yeah, like, yeah, you know, and you know, it's, uh, you know, when I work with the SES band and you know, you know, I work with Chris Thompson. I mean, Chris Thompson is one of the greatest singers of all time. Yeah. He's got a family. He is the voice. Right, yeah. and I'm working with guys like Tim, and I'm working with guys like Tony Hadley, who's got a fantastic voice, you know. And like, you know, you go, oh, that's what I want to sound like. And then Tony will come up to me after and go, "Fucking hell, Lavender was brilliant tonight." Or like, <laughs> I do a little help for my friends when I, when I remember I used to sing it with, with my old Paul Young from Sad Cafe and stuff. And yeah. he's like, "Now you had the voice," and, I, and everybody's going, "Oh, you two, you sound so good." And I'm going, "I just feel like the weakest link," you know what I mean? Uh, but that's I mean, just it's just the way I am. It's just you know this. Yeah, I think you know, it's, it's a cliche. It's like you know, every every extrovert is is, is uh, the bottom line is a, is a major introvert. And I think you know, sometimes when I go out on stage, you know, you, you you exude confidence, but inside you're kind of like you know, you're shitting it. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know? yeah. Is is that still the case now? I think mean, you know, there's, there's there's times when you know. You know, there's bits like you know the last two when you come to Heart of Lorien and you're going for those big notes and you go, oh for fuck's sake, you know. Yeah. You know, there's always that little look around that a look and a shy smile, a shy smile to the to the band. You know, go here we fucking go, you know. And but yeah, so it's yeah, I mean, but I think singing is probably about it's, it's I'd say, you know, singers is eighty five percent confidence and fifteen percent technique. You know, I think if you've got the confidence to hit it, and I, you know, I am confident on stage. You know. But inside, there's a little boy. It's, it's always, it's always there, yeah, deep in, yeah. deep in the core. You know, that's kind of, you know, so, this is. I mean, I, I enjoy it. You know, I, I hate it when my voice is gone. I mean, I hate. It. I mean, that was why I hated the Thirteen Star Tour. I came very close to resigning after the Thirteen Star Tour. I came very close to walking away then. You know, and if I hadn't discovered that, you know, that that it was, you know, a physical thing that was wrong yeah, with my it voice. Yeah, could be rectified. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. But I mean, you know, my confidence was shot at the end of the Thirteen Star Tour because I never knew how the voice was going to be any night. I think, um, I, I, th- I think that, that, that you sound at the moment like like you're in a good place. Um, yeah. you, seem, you sound like you you've got a clear idea of where you want to go and what you want to do. You know? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think ma- mapping out this this roadmap, right? I think you know, I'll putting the time together and having a plan. I like to have plans. You know, I'm 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 very, you know. I'm a bit, I wouldn't say obsessive, but I mean, I'm, I like to be methodical. I like to know where I'm going. I like to know where I'm going to go. You know, I always, I always work on what I call the back trench policy, yeah. right? And it's like, if you're going out there, then what happens if it fucks up, right? And it's, um, you know, I always try and work along that. And I like to have, I like to have a map to follow. And, you know, the, the map that I've drawn up and, and this has been, it's been getting drawn up now for probably, um, I'd say nine months ago. I think it really, it, it really came to be right uh, on the UK tour, and I'd spent I'd spent three months setting up the UK tour, setting up the the up went the beautiful single, sorting out the promotion, doing all the interviews, getting it all sorted out, 
I had loads of money in behind the promotion, everything it was everything was there, right? And then like I said, four days before the before the, the first gig, Robin goes down with the chicken pox. Yeah. And it was like and everybody everybody went away home, there was an insurance claim, right? And you know, the insurance does not pay me. You know, yeah. it doesn't pay profits, it only pays for the money you've lost, yeah. right? And so the money that I've lost or that I was due was for band wages and crew wages yeah. and bus. And everybody got fucking paid, right? Apart from me. Yeah. And I was sitting there in the house, and, you know, to, after about a week and a half, two weeks. And, it, you know, I'm sitting there going like, fucking hell, you know, because I mean, there was nothing to do. You know, it was like, how are we going to set this up, you know? And then it was, um, and it was, I was sitting there, I was sitting here on my own in this house, which is, you know, for a single person, it's just too big, it's too big for me, yeah. right? It's a garden. It's too big for me. I've got. A, I've still got a relatively large mortgage on this. That, you know, uh -huh. that I pay off every month, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's like, and my girlfriend's like thousands of miles away in Karlsruhe, right? And I spend about a third of a year now with her, right? Yeah. And um, and I was going, what the fuck am I doing, right? And there was a friend of mine. He was. He was. Uh, he was an ex-infantry guy, right? And he was. He's army career, right? And um. And his his wife has had been ill and stuff like that, and and he, he basically he resigned, right? Yeah. And it was he, it was a, for him it was a huge huge step, you know, to to leave the army, and to go back and look after his wife and kids, which I, I I thought was you know, I was I was completely I admired him so yeah. much, right? And he sent me up an an innocuous kind of message on my Facebook page, right, a, a private message, and he just said he said after all you've done. He said, you, you can leave the battlefield with honours, right? He said, <laughs> hold your head high. He said, you can leave the battlefield with honours, yeah. right? And he said, and I, he meant it in as far as the tour goes, yeah. right? right? And I took it in a completely different way, and I went, you know what? I think this is the time. And that's when I came up with the idea about moving to Germany. And that's when I came up with the initial plan, which was go to end, which was going to have the farewell tour actually in 2016. But the way, because of this year, because of the demand for the Return to Childhood shows, mm. right? I mean, for, phenomenal demand in Europe. Then, you know, suddenly there's a lot of time going by, and I went, I'm no, there's no way I'm going to write this last album and get it to the standard that I want to, to, to get it and get it out there, you know? And um, so I decided to move the whole thing back to the plan as it stands on, on, my, on my Facebook page at the moment. And on the website... I don't know, Prog Magazine and Classic Magazine, so it's all out there. And that was a huge sense of relief. I think when Prog picked up, you know, I mean, although you know, obviously, that everybody's reading your Facebook pages, right? But I think when it went out in the general media, it was kind of like, you know, well, that's it out now, you yeah. know? And it felt good. It felt really good. I, th I think, um, so, so it's more been like a, a gradual decision rather than an epiphany. You know, it's been kind of like something that, that sounds like it's been coming for a while. Uh yeah. Yeah, it has been coming for a while. I think you know, it's um, it has been coming for for it has been coming for a while. And there was always that there was always a realization that there was always going to be that realization that was going to come upon me where it's like, wait, I've got to stop now. You know, there comes and I think not naming any names, but I worked I worked with a couple of people last year, right? Mm. And they were oh, older artists, right? And you know, they were running through the same material, the same hits on the stage. Yeah. And, you know, and they were coming off and they looked absolutely bushed, yeah. you know what I mean? And I went, fuck, I don't want to be like that, yeah. you know? I don't want to be like that when I'm just going through the motions and, you know, picking up the check. I just don't want to do that, you know? You know what, what, I mean, the, the, the shows were great. I mean, you know, what, what I saw, but I mean, you know, we're going out and I'm, I'm passing, you know, I'm going to be, a couple of these guys, I'm going to be, you know, passing on festival sets this year and I know it's going to be the same set as they played last yeah. year, you know? And it's, you know, and I don't want to be playing Kaylee and Lavender and Incommunicado and Script and fucking blah, 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 and, you know, to satisfy, you know, the nostalgia freaks. I don't, I don't want to do that, you know, because then I'm, I'm starting to do it. I'm, I'm doing it, you know, it goes back to what we were talking about, about session musicians playing stuff they don't want to play, yeah. you know, and I don't want to be singing stuff that I don't want to sing. Right? Yeah. I mean, my, my biggest concern when Global asked me to do this interview, it wasn't that, you know, obviously, I've been a big fan for a long time. It was kind of a bucket list thing. It was, a, it was that your fans, um, they're the, 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 like so forensic, they're the so well 
um, versed in, in you and your lyrics and your life and the pour over every detail and they know everything down to a decimal fucking point, um, that I was nervous that, that, that I would get, you know, grief about the interview, um, you know, and it's, it's, it, was there any of that concern with you when you decided to retire? Have you had anything like that from the fans and negative no. feedback? No, I mean, you know, there's been a couple of people that said, oh, it was really disappointing, but what are you going to go about? But I'd probably say 95% of the people that have, that have read the post go, yeah, okay, we accept it. You That's know? brilliant. It's your decision and we respect it and accept it. And, you know, we're saddened that it's going to have to end, but they understand, you know, and it's, people understand completely what my reasons are, you know. And there's a lot of people turn and say, yeah, we're looking for what you're going to do next. You know, yeah. we're looking for what you're going to write about. I mean, Absolutely. I was across in I was across in, in Germany last week, and I had an absolute fucking, you know, it, I was sit, sitting there on the balcony and 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 do like it where my my girlfriend lives, you know, and I just had this idea for a complete novel came into my head, right, and within the space of three days, you know, I was starting taking notes, you right. know, and you know, and that's where I'm at, and that's what's exciting me now, you know, and I wasn't. You know, and I've had ideas for Welsh maps and things like that, but they're, they're related to the writing, yeah. you know. And, um, and you know, that's, I think, where the fans know that they're going to be getting something. That, you know, I'm still going to be creating, yeah. I'm still going to be writing. It just it won't be to music, you know. A, a few years ago, you did the, um, I think, you Into or Inside the Electric Castle thing for Arian or... Arian, yeah. Uh, w would that be the sort of thing you'd still maybe do, like the one-off sort of guest no. appearance? No, no, no. Okay. Um, you know, just thought that maybe with it being a, like a kind of not a thing you had to commit to 100. percent No, I, I, I don't. I just I want I do I want to try and leave the music stuff Fair behind. Enough. You know, to, to to you know I you know like I said I ran my catalogue up with the last album, and then I've got I want to concentrate on screenplays. Then I want to concentrate on 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 novels. Then I want to concentrate on autobiography. I want to take the time. I want to grow vegetables. I want to sit in the in the room during the day and not have to worry about. Promoting and all the rest of it that goes that goes along with us. I mean, you know, I manage myself. I mean, you know, when I come off the phone to you today, I'm straight on a, you know, talking about a German TV appearance in Dresden. I've got to chase up my production manager about Norwegian dates. I've got to reschedule a Danish date. I'm I'm chasing down a Luxembourg festival. Blah 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 blah. That's what I'm doing this afternoon. You know, and it's you know I'm I'm looking forward to the time when I just have to worry about being a creative artist. You know? Well, I, th I think that if, you know, I think that's great. If, if, at least you have a clear idea of what you want to do, and it'll, you know, mm. and, and we've got something to look forward to as fans. You know? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I mean, you know, the, it's not the immediate future. I mean, it's it's 2017, and you know, you know, it's marked. You know, I mean, it's you know, be aware that you know when I go on, when I'm starting going out on these dates, you know, th th these are the farewell dates. You know, when I start doing, when I start working next May. Right? Yeah. When I go out in the road next May, those are the final shows, and the shows this year for Fairway Watch Road. This is the last time I am going to be playing this place with ever, yeah. right? This year. No? Okay. Well, thank you for your time. And it's, uh, thank you. Yeah. That was nice talking to no, you. It's very nice talking to you. It's sort of a, I can tick this off my list now. Um, good, good. And I hope to uh, see you again live again uh, sometime. In the future. Um, oh, no, no doubt, no doubt. Best, no doubt. Uh, best wishes, and we'll uh, hopefully speak to you again. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, a lot. Thanks for Thank that. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.